Hello and welcome back to Core Finance with me, Matt Brown. I'm joined by Sean Richards, who is not a yes man economics, never has been a yes man, I'm sure. Um, and you're going to talk to us today about parallel currencies. So can you just explain, give a brief overview to our viewers what a parallel currency is? Okay. And actually, the example I'm going to discuss uh, today is not the normal thing of this. To give an example of what we're normally discussing here, um, if you look at somewhere like Ukraine, has its own currency. I struggle to pronounce it. I'll give it a go. Hervina, I think. Um, but through the sort of crisis after the Russian invasion or whatever you want to call that from before, we see that the US dollar, in effect, in many places became the currency. And this is the normal thing of what you might call parallel currency, where something comes in and it's unofficial. It's kind of almost a thing of Italy, the suggestions going forward, it's unofficial. But how can you call something unofficial when the government's proposing it? Should... Um, Berlusconi get in or some of the parties that are looking at this and if we add all of them together and assume that they'd go together which might be slightly dubious but if we do you get to somewhere around two-thirds of the Italian electorate so that's why people are taking an interest in this mm. and this saga has come forwards as in they'll have not really quite a new lira but things where you can pay bonds in pay your taxes in that sort of thing and so have two currencies at once hence the parallel concept now, this begs quite a few questions, like what will the exchange rate be? Mm -hmm. Capital flight, for example, we think that people might flood to the euro, Swiss franc, maybe even the poor battered pound, it could do with it. Um, and then also, how exactly would they run this? Because if we look forwards, um, there's the issue of the fact that a lot of their debt at the minute is in euros, both for the government, for the Italian banks. So there's a whole question of things rolling around here. But I've put things in one category against. If we look at it the other way, this poses quite a few questions for the euro, conceptually, yes. Mm -hmm. But something I've looked at quite a bit in the past, you see it's quite different from other central banks. If we look at the UK, then you see that the Treasury backs it. Look at the US, its Treasury does, Japan, Japanese Treasury and so on. The ECB, though, has about 19 Treasuries backing it. Yes. Now, how do you run this if one pulls out, particularly one of the bigger ones? So th this is based on the assumption that Italy leaves the EU? Yes. And obviously the lira will come under pressure, one assumes, um, from the get-go. So looking to effectively peg against the US dollar, is, is that what you're saying? Well, pegging or against the euro would be the, the starting point. Would be the starting point, but then actually to use the dollar as a, as a currency. Well, no, it'd be the lira. It would right? be the new lira, lira effect, if, if they went that far. Mm -hmm. But you see, this poses lots of questions, because how then would it then relate to the euro thing? It would make the Brexit negotiations look like a tea party, as you've mm -hmm. discussed that. Yes. If they said no to pay, OK, the ECB would come in. How would they enforce this? Could they enforce rules on Italy at the same time they were doing them on the UK and so on? That would start to create a lot of issues. In terms of the monetary situation itself, we could say in like the Ukraine example that I discussed before, or in other countries we see, you get a lot of different exchange rates at the same time, the official one, the unofficial one, do you know? And so there's, there's a whole raft of questions posed by this, but at, at, at the bottom of it is the simple fact, if you look at the economic performance of Italy, it's been poor. Mm -hmm. Better this morning. It's starting to improve. Yes, but you see that we've had so many times like this, it's very similar to Portugal, ironically, mm -hmm. in the fact that in the good years, if you look back, it manages about 1% growth a year over the past couple of decades, mm -hmm. not much, and then it loses ground, so that then you find it's not done very well at all. If you compare, and we can only go to 2016 now, but I looked at some numbers earlier, and it's something like um, per person, GDP was 28,700 euros, it's mm -hmm. now more like 25,700 economy hasn't shrunk that much, it's more the population's gone up. Yes. But for the point of view of the individual Italian, you can start to see how this might be attractive to them, something sold to them as an economic gain. Yes, it's now doing better, mm -hmm. but it's got quite a long way to go to get that ground back. And that's how there's sort of fertile ground for this. Whether it will come to anything, I don't know. But one of the things it will do, even the talk of it has unsettled things a little bit. Now, in the Italian government bond market, the European Central Bank will just buy those, so in that itself, that's just a flicker, I think. But it does pose quite a lot of deeper questions going forwards for the whole concept, for Italy. Would Italy, as a whole. Yes, I mean, would Italy, for example, 
go back into its old spiral of the lira just devaluing all the time, for example. So it's by no means a panacea, but it does pose a lot of questions. Chances of this happening, and if so, when? It's going to happen, probably, you'd imagine, like next year, wouldn't you? Something post-election. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. I'm not sure I can put a percentage on it, I'm afraid. Well, next time we get you on, we'll, uh, we'll try and nail you down on a, okay. a percentage. Okay. But anyway, in the meantime, Sean, thank you very much for joining us today.